What I'd like to talk to you about today is what we've learned about the distributional consequences of trade in this recent spate of, of research. Uh, contrast this to what we've learned about technology's impact on labor markets. Uh, say a bit about how we can tell the difference between trade versus technology on labor market outcomes, and then close with some thoughts about what this research uh, tells us in a quite preliminary fashion about the consequences of new tariffs that have been placed uh, on, on, on U.S. imports. So um, uh, oftentimes in a presidential administration, it's, it's difficult to pin down exactly what key decision makers think about trade because they, <laughs> they hold their cards close to their chest. Um, we're living in a current political moment in which uh, that is not the case. Um, if we read the president's tweets, we get a pretty clear idea about what he thinks about uh, trade. And, and it, uh, the, the striking feature of this is this break with the U.S. Uh, uh, stance behind globalization in trying to create the institutions for, for freer international trade, which we started back in, uh, in 1947. Um, so uh, the, uh, the rise of, of, of populism and economic nationalism is, is well documented. The question kind of for us today is, is did international trade play any role uh, in the origins of, uh, of that opposition? I, and and uh, my sense is that the answer to that is, is yes. And this comes from the work I've done with David Otter and David Dorn uh, and a number of other co-authors, uh, as well as the work uh, that many of our colleagues have done. Um, and I'll talk in particular about the work that um, uh, Justin Pierce um, uh, and, uh, and Pete Schott have done on this, on this question. So to understand how we got here, go back to what we thought globalization was going to deliver us 25 years ago, which was at the beginning of kind of this, this great second wave, the fall of the Berlin Wall, trade liberalization sweeping the developing world, um, and lots of new countries joining the WTO. Um, you look at what President Clinton said about the NAFTA signing, and he was promising uh, a lot not just uh, a couple percent income gains, which is kind of what your standard GE model uh, was going to tell you. I was going to clean up the environment and solve world peace. Um, now, the danger in overselling is that it created a set of expectations about what globalization would do and what uh, it wouldn't do. Now, what we have learned from research over time is that, uh, to be sure, uh, globalization has led to uh, aggregate income gains, aggregate welfare gains uh, in the United States. We know this from a whole series of models that use uh, the best quantitative insights we have to model the U.S. in the global economy, um, and those results are not in, uh, in much dispute. Um, uh, and so that, that, that intuition we had 25 years ago is not really unchanged. What has changed is our sense of what are the distributional impacts of, of trade and where those distributional impacts uh, 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 come from. So go back also now 30 years and, and look at what uh, leading writers of international economics textbooks would have said at the time about the distributional consequences of trade. Um, and so Krugman and Obsfeld just quoted the, basically the Hechtrelin uh, 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 theorem. Um, and its manifestation in the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, which is that trade, the impacts of trade are going to play out in national labor markets, and they're going to have differentiated impacts on individuals according to their skill level or according to their education level. When we then took that approach in the 1990s uh, and tried to understand the impacts uh, of trade on, la on national labor markets differentiated by skill, we found uh, impacts. So some of the work I did very early in, in my career uh, jointly with Rob uh, Feenstra. What we also found at the time, as we tried to look for quantitative measures of the exposure of industries uh, to technological change, is that it looked like the impacts of technological change uh, were larger. Um, the labor economists were a little um, less equivocal about this at the time. They said, it's all technology, uh, trade is irrelevant. Uh, so we kind of had that dispute for a bit, but what wasn't in dispute was we want to think of this, the frame we want to take is thinking about these shocks being transmitted through national labor markets differentiated uh, by skill. So what's happened since is we've had this incredible natural experiment in which we can examine the margins of adjustment to trade shocks, uh, and that natural experiment was uh, the China shock. Um, so when I just, uh, you know, many of us are, are, are quite familiar with the dimensions of China's growth, I just want to highlight two important features and why the, uh, the expansion of China's exports have been uh, such an important tool for empirical research uh, in trade. Uh, one is the speed with which China made this transition. Nobody in uh, 1978 
uh, thought that China was going to become an export powerhouse over the next two decades. In fact, nobody in 1988 thought that either. In 1989, the Wall Street Journal uh, prognosticated that China would be one of the laggard economies of the 1990s, uh, owing to the stultifying effects of communist bureaucracy. Um, the story turned out to be a little bit different, as we all know, and China went from around 2% of global uh, exports of manufacturing goods to around 20% today. So that speed um, is one important component that makes China a very uh, useful laboratory in which to, to study these issues. The other is the magnitude. Uh, China, as we know, is really, really big. So when you get a sudden shock and a very large shock, uh, it, it gives you lots of empirical leverage. The second feature, or a third feature of the China shock um, is that for a big country, China was unusual in having an extreme comparative advantage. And that comparative advantage initially was in manufacturing and within manufacturing in labor intensive uh, activities. So what this meant is, uh, depending on your position in the global economy, uh, the rise of China either meant uh, a tremendous negative shock to the demand for the stuff that you produce, if you happen to be specialized in China's export goods, or a tremendous positive shock to the stuff that you produce if you happen to be specialized in the goods that China's manufacturing sector needed to import to make uh, all of that uh, stuff. So those features are what have made China so useful. Um, what kind of uh, we get uh, uh, tripped up on and as we talk about this research is the notion that China is the only thing that's happened in the global economy in the last 30 years. No. There's lots of stuff that has gone on. NAFTA happened in the intervening per period. The EU played itself out. Many other developing countries joined the global economy. The centrality of China in the academic debate comes from the fact that it gives us so much empirical leverage. So I'm going to use the China laboratory to talk about these impacts, but I don't want uh, 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 at all to suggest that China is the only game in town when it comes to under, uh, understanding these shocks. China has be played a dis disproportionate role in the empirical research as we try to understand what margins of adjustment are operative as countries face changes in the international economic, economic environment. That's what kind of reduced form empirical work is stuffed with, stuff with, stuff we can study, shocks that, whose impact we can causally identify. When it comes to the GE analyses, they've been more ecumenical. They've been able to look at a broader range of shocks and help us understand uh, the importance of trade versus technology uh, and trade with, uh, uh, with different nations. Um, so what have we learned about uh, the impact of, of trade shocks through uh, our ex the experience of China's explosive uh, growth? The most important thing we've learned is that that frame of national labor markets differentiated by skill is not really the right frame. What we want to think of is the U.S. economy, at least, is as a collection of small open economies uh, in which labor is largely immobile. Now, that's an extreme statement, and immobile, we don't mean completely immobile. We just mean that regional adjustment, regional movements of labor in response to negative labor demand shocks uh, is slow. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, as we produce the first work on understanding China's impact, impact on labor, la local labor markets, what we found was very strong adjustment in terms of negative employment uh, impacts on regions that were specialized in the goods that China uh, exports. Um, that was uh, those negative employment impacts came not from firms downsizing, uh, they came from firms exiting, came from plant uh, a clo a closure. So Steve just mentioned one of the papers in, uh, in the conference by Asquith, Goswami, um, Newmark, and uh, Rodriguez Lopez. That paper uh, doesn't use the county business patterns paper that David Otter and David Dorden and I use. They use a version of the Dun and Bradstreet data so they can look at what happens at, uh, in terms of uh, plant entry and exit. And they find that the bulk of the employment losses associated with the China shock came through plant closure. And that'll be important for some of the issues I discuss uh, 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 in, uh, in a couple of minutes. So that margin, the fact that you've got these economies that are locally specialized, um, if labor's not moving, then we don't have a national labor market for low-skilled labor. What we have is a bunch of regional labor markets, and adjustment to that shock in terms of labor moving across regions seems to take a long time, well more than a decade. Um, so that was uh, uh, the, the first thing that, that we understood. Second is now that we're talking about kind of small open economies that are subject to big shocks, and in these small open economies, 
were the areas, and I'll show you maps in just uh, a couple of minutes, um, the areas that were hit are you know, primarily smaller and medium-sized manufacturing towns. So plant closure in those localities is equivalent to a local recession and a pretty severe one at that. And that then accumulates in terms of uh, a negative aggregate demand shock for local economic activity. And that perhaps helps account for why when these workers who lost their jobs in manufacturing uh, did not get readily absorbed into other activities. What we saw was prolonged increases in non-participation in the labor force primarily and increases in unemployment secondarily. Those broader income declines meant that in these locality, work by Feller and Sensi's has shown us, led to reductions in housing prices and an eroded uh, tax base. So these communities were then losing some tools, some instruments that they could have used to kind of fight these local recessions because of what was happening in terms of uh, uh, local public finance. So that's uh, kind of on the, uh, the import competing side. If that story is true, we should see that uh, the, the reverse uh, occurring in, in regions that specialize in, in import, in, in goods that China imports. So here we do have results that substantiate exact, exactly that reverse effect. Regions that produce uh, commodities that China um, uh, imports or regions that produce machine tools that China imports have seen employment growth, uh, wage growth, uh, and increases in um, uh, real incomes in those localities. The research, though, has now found any of that in the US. It's found that in Brazil. It's found that in Australia. It's found it in Germany. Um, the US context is complicated by the fact that many of the firms that produce inputs that, that China Inc. imports are not producing goods, they're producing services. And so being able to measure the demand shock for the services derived largely from intellectual property that US firms produce has been much more complicated. Our intuition tells us that those impacts are there. Uh, getting an empirical lever on, on estimating those impacts has been more difficult. So we've been kind of stuck with looking at, at most of this as operating within manufacturing or near uh, manufacturing. Um, uh, any model, if it was fully specified, would suggest that part of that tremendous increase in housing values and incomes in Silicon Valley is associated with Silicon Valley's uh, ability to export the services derived from intellectual property to China. Our economic models are poorly suited to get at the magnitudes uh, of those impacts. Um, now what about uh, impacts of technological change? So here the empirical challenge is more difficult. Uh, China was great. It was big, it was fast, and it was concentrated. With technological change, uh, our, our ready measures um, are, are, are not so much at hand. So what we've seen is tremendous innovation over the last couple, de a couple of decades in terms of trying to gauge the exposure of industries, of regions, and of individuals to changes in uh, technology. So the approach that, um, that researchers have taken, to just to kind of go back to the 1990s where all this started, uh, the first thing, the first measure that we utilized was the intensity of industries in computer investment. Uh, computers were kind of a new thing in the 1990s and their adoption in the workplace was kind of a new thing. So we saw this substantial increases in computer investment across industries in the course of the 1990s and that varied substantially by industry according to their intensity in the use of what you can think of as high-tech high capital equipment. So that was the measure that labor economists used in the 90s. It was the measure that uh, Rob Pinsner and I used uh, in our work. Subsequently, we've come up with additional measures. So one that David Otter and David Dorn pioneered uh, in, uh, in their work in a uh, 2013 AR paper was to say, one of the important manifestations of technological change has been automating production. So it's hard to observe automation uh, directly because we don't know a lot of details about the type of capital equipment that, that firms purchase. We know it's computers, we know it's not computers, we know what's machinery versus not machinery. We don't know which, which of that machinery is uh, replacing act, uh, labor that used to do stuff uh, by hand. So they constructed a measure of the exposure of occupations to automation based on the task intensity of those occupations, uh, looking at how specialized is an occupation in routine tasks, tasks that involve uh, repetitive uh, uh, movements. Um, and what they found uh, was results that are different qualitatively from what we find in exposure to trade. 
rather than employment dec declines in regions that were specialized in routine intensive occupations, what you saw was a change in relative de labor demand across the wage distribution with declines, uh, relative declines in the middle of the distribution, uh, increases in relative demand in the tails of the distribution, and the result was a polarization in economic outcomes and what they call this, this hollowing out uh, of the U.S. labor market. Now, subsequent uh, work by Goose and Manning, by uh, Michael et al., um, then used similar approaches uh, to document that those changes in labor demand, not surprisingly, were associated with greater uh, earnings inequality in these regions that were more specialized uh, in, um, in routine intensive uh, occupations. Here again, we're using the region as a laboratory, which is consistent with the idea that labor's not sufficiently mobile across space to transmit these shocks uh, nationally. Now, the most, um, the most recent innovation we have uh, is, comes from work by Asamoglu and Restrepo, in which we actually have measures now of industry uh, adoption uh, of robots. Um, so, uh, hint for young academics out there, if you put robots in the title of your paper, you will increase citations by three orders uh, of magnitude. Um, so I think Asamoglu and Restrepo set the record for a paper appearing in the, work, in the NBR Working Paper Series to coming into print in the AER. I think it was 72 hours or something like that. I'm exaggerating. Um, so what they find is uh, our, our qualitative impacts that now look more like the China shock. It's not just moving labor around the, uh, the wage distribution. What it's doing is actually uh, decreasing employment in the aggregate uh, in these localities, uh, uh, average uh, earning declines and increases in uh, labor force exit. So we've got these two things going on, which empirical literature has documented. This work is all reduced form, so it's not well suited to kind of adding them up and telling, uh, telling us about the general equilibrium uh, uh, impacts. Um, some of uh, Rob Feenster's marks later this morning will we'll get at these. But just in this context, how do we tell the difference between uh, trade and technology? Um, well, to start, in all of this work, you want to control, if you're trying to understand the, the exposure of a region to trade, you want to control for uh, all the things we learned about in decades past about what makes particular industries more prone to the adoption of labor-saving technology. And so that means how specialized industries are in computers, uh, in capital, in skilled workers. And you're controlling for regional specialization in those activities. So all of this work already has those sets of controls in there, and that absorbs a lot um, of, uh, of this exposure. Um, but more importantly, we can look at the recent research itself and, uh, and learn some important clues that tell us that the places that have been hit by these technology shocks are in large part not the places that have been hit by the trade shocks. So one important clue there is that if you look at, uh, the re uh, as I said, the regions that have been hit by the China shock, what have we seen? We've seen plants close. When you automate, what do you do? You don't downsize, you upsize, you just change the factor intensity of production. So rather than seeing plants close, the areas that are automating see uh, plants renovate. Uh, and that's not what we've seen in the case of the China shock. Um, so that's uh, uh, an important clue. Now among surviving plants, and that, uh, that comes, that uh, insights there go all the way back to the first paper on the China shock, which was Bernard Jensen and, uh, um, uh, and Schott. Uh, and, uh, and is documented more recently in the Asquith et al. paper in, in this particular NBR uh, project. So what Pierce and Schott show uh, in, this, um, uh, in their contribution to this project is that among these surviving plants, so they also find evidence on, on this, uh, uh, this, this extensive margin adjustment, plant closure in response to import competition. Among surviving plants, what do you see? Not increases in investment, like you would expect to see if trade were just uh, operating in place of technology. You see investment declines. Um, but second, if we use our existing measures of exposure to trade and technology, what do we see? We see, in fact, that the places that have been subject to these two shocks uh, are quite different. Um, so this comes from work that uh, David Otter and David Orn, uh, Dorn and I did in, a, um, in another paper. On the top, uh, what you see are uh, commuting zones in the United States differentiated by their exposure to increased import competition uh, from China. On the bottom, you see commuting zones in the United States differentiated by their exposure to automation as measured by this initial specialization in routine intensive uh, occupations. Um, what you see, it's kind of a quick glance, is they don't look exactly the same, so let's be a little bit more precise. Um, let's look at the set of regions that are highly exposed to both. 
Um, and it's just a handful of locations. Uh, and in fact, the correlation across commuting zones in exposure to automation as measured by Otter and Dorn and to import competition from China is essentially zero. Uh, there's a good reason for this. Those autom the automation has hit larger cities. It hit, it's hit lots of non-manufacturing uh, industries. The China shock primarily hit places that were uh, strongly specialized in, um, uh, in manufacturing. So on that manufacturing dimension, uh, there's an important piece that we've learned about, and this was not so much work that has, uh, has come up in, in this particular volume, but work that uh, I've done uh, uh, subsequently with David Otter and David Dorn, and that Justin uh, Pierce and Peter Schott have done, and that's understanding, well, if you are seeing job loss in, manu uh, in manufacturing, what are some of the attendant social uh, consequences? So the, the important feature uh, of manufacturing for understanding those impacts is that manufacturing is unique in offering high paying jobs to less educated males. Um, women are employed in manufacturing to be sure, but manufacturing at the beginning of the China shock was still a male dominated profession and a profession dominated among production workers by individuals with less uh, than a college education. So what happens when you're in a region that gets hit by one of these shocks, it's less educated males that get hit disproportionately hard. So, what ha so the, the uh, immediate impact of that is not just an absolute decline in male earnings for less educated males, it's also a compression in the male-female earnings differential. We know from abundant research in, um, in labor economics that when that male-female wage differential depresses is had immediate impacts on, on the marriage market and on family formation. And you see reduced uh, uh, marriage rates um, and increasing incidence of, uh, of out of wedlock uh, uh, births. So that's something that uh, Otter and Dorn and I document in a paper forthcoming in uh, AER Insights. Um, but that's not the only impact or necessarily even the most pernicious uh, impacts. Now that, uh, that less educated men um, are less disciplined by the labor market and less disciplined by, the, uh, by the, the marriage market, they tend to get themselves into trouble. And so there's evidence of increased incarceration rates and more troublingly uh, increases in drug and alcohol abuse. So in work that, um, that Pierce and Schott have done, uh, what they find is that these regions that are more exposed to the China shock have seen increased mortality. That in, and that increased mortality is uh, uh, in its uh, preponderance due to uh, deaths associated with substance abuse. Um, and so that loss of, of manufacturing livelihood then feeds into uh, the opioid epidemic uh, that we're seeing now. Now, again, I don't want to say that the China shock caused the opioid epidemic. Uh, what the China shock allows us to do is to say, does the loss of high paying jobs to low wage workers contribute to something like drug and alcohol abuse? The answer very much seems uh, to be yes. In the aggregate, the China shock might be way down the list in terms uh, the, of the overall drivers of that particular uh, outcome. So that then gives us insights into why uh, the scarring effects of, of, of manufacturing job loss uh, are so extreme. One is that it's hitting less educated men uh, uh, particularly hard. Two is that this job loss has occurred through uh, plant closure uh, and therefore is, if not permanent, at least uh, long lasting and you get these extended local recessions and this may play a role in why the convergence in regional incomes across the United States, which Barrow and Sally Martin documented long ago, stopped not long after they published their paper. And now what we're seeing is regional divergence uh, with globalization and technological change um, all being potentially uh, uh, contributing uh, factors. And then the kind of the, the thing we really learned here about the, the, the origins of these scarring effects is this absence of labor mobility. Now, where does that absence of labor mobility comes from? Um, it may come from housing markets. It may come from uh, individuals being underwater on their mortgages and therefore finding it difficult to move. It may come from family structure. Uh, that is, these individuals may be very reliant on ex an extended family for childcare. And given that in, in many of these communities, those with a high school education are less, the uh, majority of kids are now in single parent households, moving is not a two-body problem, it's a two-household problem. And so that, it gets much more complicated to take advantage of wage gains <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, the third feature that, that uh, plays a role here uh, may be social policy. 
Um, so this is something I want to put out there uh, as speculative uh, we've, uh, and uh, that drives from uh, some of our original results on the impacts of the China shock. And that is, if you look at the margins of adjustment in terms of uptake of government benefits in response to uh, trade-induced manufacturing job loss, you saw some, th some adjustment that you'd expect to see, increases in long-term unemployment insurance, uh, increases in, in trade adjustment <coughs> assistance, but then you saw some things you wouldn't necessarily expect to see and that is increases in Social Security disability uh, benefits. And what has happened in this instance, as in many other instances documented by a large labor literature in which Mark Dugan, David Otter, and, and many others have contributed to, is that in response to adverse labor demand shocks, workers are using disability insurance as a mechanism to adjust to bad things that have happened in their lives. How this hinders adjustment is that those workers then uh, tend to exit the labor force uh, permanently. We don't know yet the, the relative contribution of these different factors to low labor mobility uh, in the United States. Uh, there's ongoing work by Danny Yagan and Rebecca Diamond trying to understand uh, the relative contributions of, of these things. And what we're finding is impacts that are there, um, but our, the, the standard air bounds uh, seem to be pretty large. Um, so finally, I want to close with just thinking about, well, based on what we've learned so far, now we're putting um, tariffs on uh, imports uh, from the rest of the world and from China in particular. Uh, will these tariffs bring manufacturing jobs back? Okay, so to really answer that question, we want to arm up some, G, uh, some uh, quantitative trade models and, uh, and, uh, and, and figure out uh, all the substitution effects that are, uh, are going to go on. But I want you to, to highlight two features of that adjustment process which should make us uh, dubious about the prospect for the tariffs as we've seen them so far to bring manufacturing jobs back. One is just kind of an obvious one, is that these tariffs are not multilateral, they're bilateral. So we impose higher tariffs on China. What will U.S. consumers do? Well, they might buy from U.S. producers, but just as likely they might buy from Vietnamese or Bangladeshi uh, producers, especially in labor-intensive uh, uh, activities. So bilateral tariffs are a weak instrument for bringing production back to the United States. Suppose, however, um, the Trump administration expands those tariffs so that they are multilateral, so they apply to all U.S. imports. Would then that bring manufacturing employment back? Now, we could use tariffs to bring manufacturing production back. If you shut down imports of manufactured goods, we're going to produce that stuff uh, at home. But here, go back and think about the nature of the job loss that we detected as a result of the China shock. It was as a result of plant closure. So that, that capital and equipment is offline. That, those production facilities used 20th century technology, which was much more labor intensive than the new plants being built today. So even if we get to the point of having much more expansive tariffs and do bring manufacturing production back, it's going to be in newly built 21st century facilities, which are likely to be much less uh, labor intensive. Uh, so if you had to think about, we had to, uh, th to think about the, the tools that the U.S. government uh, has at its disposal to affect manufacturing employment, tariffs as they're currently formulated would seem to have um, uh, uh, pretty weak impacts. So, uh, to close, um, I want to uh, just reiterate the, 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 the two key findings that, that Steve opened, uh, uh, mentioned in his opening remarks. Um, one is that, you know, what we've learned about the U.S. experience with globalization over the last uh, couple of decades is kind of um, what, we, what we had thought in the aggregate. We see these nice gains from trade. Uh, we're arguing over how big those gains from trade are. Uh, that argument has to be over uh, which underlying model is responsible for trade secondarily, and but primarily about the magnitude, magnitude of uh, trade cost uh, elasticities. There's not a lot of dispute about the sign of the impact of expanded trade um, on, US, on U.S. aggregate income. What we have learned, though, is that these distributional uh, impacts um, are concentrated, uh, in, uh, and, and that concentration has led to prolonged disruption, disruption in particular parts of the U.S. economy. Lots of parts of the U.S. economy haven't been affected. Those particular parts of the U.S. economy have let their voices uh, be heard. Those are areas um, that have shifted, uh, the areas that have been harder hit by trade and truce manufacturing decline are areas that have seen uh, stronger support for economic nationalists uh, when running uh, uh, for office. And so the, the consequences beyond what's happening in these labor markets uh, is real. Thank you very much.